All right, welcome. We are here today to talk to Father Vladimir Kadenov. Father Vladimir has a special connection to the Florence Academy, and we're going to be talking about that today. He's going to give us some insights into his approach to the history of and the, the techniques of Renaissance art. And so I'm going to let him give a little introduction as to what he's into, what he does, his specialty, and how he got into this. And then we'll kind of launch into discussing the uh, images and the presentation that uh, that he deals with at the Florence Academy. Uh, yes, thank you, Jay. It's a pleasure being on your show. I'm a big fan. Thank you. And this is the day I am with you on the show as a participant, and I'm very excited. Um, I serve uh, as a an Orthodox priest in the Russian church outside of Russia. Um, in Florida, near St. Augustine, Florida, in Palm Coast. And um, my church is called St. Nicholas Russian Orthodox Church, after the St. Nicholas. And um, my connection to, um, to Renaissance and to art is a, is a kind of a, an, a, a long story in a way. And I was going to try to tell it in, in the context of connection between uh, our Russia and Europe in an artistic tradition and an academic tradition. Um, and I've uh, prepared some, uh, what I thought were beautiful images uh, to kind of uh, help us move along this path um, and we can begin to look at some pictures um, starting right away, or if you have a little more questions you would like to ask. No, that's fine. Let's get into it. So you uh, begin your presentation, you talk about uh, Russian succession, and then we'll look at this uh, image here of Moscow uh, Kremlin rebuilt in 1482 to 1495. So tell us about Russian succession, if you want to kick it off. Uh, yes, I um, I think it's fascinating, and sometimes it kind of s slips the mainstream sort of perception that uh, Russia had a tremendous influence of um, culture that had been adapted, and at some points it has been beautifully, really stylized and brought into a kind of uh, its unique. View aesthetic that you see, like in this, uh, you know, beautiful shot, air shot of uh, Kremlin. But what we often don't realize that a lot of the architects, or at least uh, some of the founding architects of these um, landmarks were coming from, uh, mostly for, were coming from first from Italy during the Renaissance period and bringing, um, bringing the knowledge and um, helping uh, Russia to kind of uh, take its place in, uh, as a world power. Um, and that was recognized and that was appreciated uh, by the Russian czars, by the Russian ruling um, powers and wisely so uh, integrated and used. Um, and uh, the purpose of my uh, story, just to kind of uh, explain as to why I'm talking about this so much, is that I am interested in uh, an unbroken chain of succession, if you will, a, a kind of, um, that's close to me uh, um, in a spiritual context as a priest, as we uh, uh, serve in what we call the holy apostolic uh, church, uh, Catholic, not from a point obviously of Vatican Catholic, but Catholic universally from the Greek word. And uh, that universal church that is Orthodox church from our perspective maintains an apostolic succession. And that apostolic succession, of course, is not the same as a succession of art uh, masters, let's uh, say, but uh, I do see uh, from my own experience and from uh, obviously historic um, references that are infinite, that 
uh, art, uh, especially art in a sense of sacred art, um, art that is devoted to God, uh, to glorifying God in architecture and visual art, uh, and not only, of course, um, that that has a similar um, principle working. And that principle is that unbroken chain of succession of master to a pupil of a workshop or a tradition, then slowly expanding uh, in a way into what we will kind of come in a, a, a some point in this discussion to what we call academic tradition, which is definitely an unfoldment of that uh, smaller workshop type of scenario, bottegas as they call them in Italy. And my connection to it is that I, my, um, a lot of my life had um, um, an important change happen in my life in Florence, Italy, where I was working for, um, at the time, it was called Russian Acad or an Academy of Russian Art, which in itself um, is an interesting name for our school in Florence. And this is pretty much the one of the purposes of this introductory um, conversation I wanted to have with you and your viewers as to what is Russian art, what does the Russian art have to do with uh, Florence? And you have a, a, a program, right, that we'll be mentioning here. I'll let you explain a little bit about that. And then at the end, I'll also have links as well in the show description below where people can go to the academy and they can uh, sort of name drop you if they're interested in signing up for uh, the, the Florence Academy. So do you want to talk about what that program is before we get into your slides? Yes, um, I can. Uh, Florence Academy, uh, Florence Classical Arts Academy, there are actually a number of academies in Florence, starting from Academia Belle Arte, which is uh, the state-funded uh, ancient uh, 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 Italian school that is uh, basically been funded and we'll talk a little bit about it at the time of Michelangelo. And um, that school remains there in Florence as well. That's where we would find the uh, Galleria Academia where everybody knows the most famous of all sculptures in the world. And I don't think I even need to name it. You probably can say it, it's um, David. And that school is, um, to our knowledge, and with all due respect, has moved into the same trend as most schools have in the current art uh, educational field, which is pretty much uh, um, deeply affected by modern uh, conceptualization, modernization, post-modernization, and on a decomposition, deconstruction, and so on, which is something I will not uh, want to talk about much uh, at this stage of our um, uh, conversation, because it's a whole other conversation. But nevertheless, just to kind of make it clear, uh, so when our friends go to look at Florence art or Florence academies, they will find uh, a whole range of schools. And um, ours is called Florence Classical Arts Academy. And of course, as Jay mentioned, if you do, well, if you would like to uh, start to study art, and I hope after this uh, dialogue, this will interest you more, and you would like to know the difference between classical art, photorealism as a copying of what you see versus academic tradition, which we will be talking about and primarily, and that is the stuff you do see in museums for the most part still in classical arts collections, is the stuff that was made uh, in the same way that we are teaching it in Florence now. And um, does that answer your question? Yeah, that's perfect. So let's get back to these slides. Now you've got the <clears throat> the, the, the one about the Kremlin. Uh, uh, did you want to touch on that before we get to the uh, next uh, image, which is the Dormition? Yes, uh, just briefly, I, I pulled up these beautiful landmarks that I wanted to kind of um, allow the viewer to take in and to understand them as, uh, well, to, to, to give acknowledgement to the fact that they were built by uh, mainly Italian, some French architects. 
And uh, as we move uh, uh, along, maybe the next shot of Uspensky, their mission cathedral yep. in the same complex of Kremlin um, was consecrated in 1479, was also the work of Italian uh, architects. And that's uh, one of the most ancient is uh, you know, burial grounds for the royal families of Russia in there. Um, it's, uh, it's a heart of Russia, if you will, in, in many ways. And then the next personal uh, a portrait you see, uh, we don't know entirely if this is exactly what he looked like, but there is a lot of um, evidence that this was the uh, uh, the famous architect who is responsible for building most of the Kremlin complex, that's Aristotle, which is a very Greek name, though he was of Italian origin, Fioravanti. And uh, he was called in uh, to help Russia and actually played a very uh, crucial role in a lot of different, uh, not so much, I would say political, but strategic things. He um not only was an incredible architect and engineer he was uh they didn't just end up in russia uh you know off the street so to speak in italy they had to obviously have been um celebrated engineers in some way uh known across europe to be hired by the russian court well in his case uh he did something incredible that was never done before. He moved a tower in Bologna that was sinking in the main piazza. That was a pretty large tower, probably like a nine story, I don't know, maybe nine story, maybe five, seven story building of uh, concrete that he, uh, being rather young, I, I remember he was in the 20s and he was able to manage this project and actually execute it. And he moved it, I think, about 15 to 20 feet from the place where it was falling, just like in Pisa. And he moved it over. And it's, so the fame went across Europe. Uh, now, this person was a very instrumental in a lot of things. Uh, he was uh brought in by Sophia Paleologos, which is a very important figure in what again we would consider um uh, the idea of the succession that I'm so fascinated with. Uh, you can see in the next shot the uh the coat of arms of the Byzantine emperors, Paleolog dynasty, mm -hmm. and they are the uh, they call the purple born, or it's the room that was made out of this special stone perfir, which is uh, was only designated to the royal families of Rome. And the uh, room uh, where the emperors were born was made entirely of this material. It's purple, uh, beautiful material that if you if you travel through Ravenna or Italy or even uh, a lot of places in, in, in Rome in general, you'll find this beautiful deep purple that's used in churches or used in uh, sometimes it's very uh, noticeable. There is no more uh, right. of this stone left, wow. but it was uh, even a criminal to use it for your home. Mm -hmm. It was only designated at the ancient Roman times, only for the imperial uh, caste. And okay. uh, specifically for being born in the room meant that you were of the highest birth possible. So now uh, with well, that said- I have a question, have a question yes. on that real quick. One question I have is something that you talked about when I first met you. I saw a presentation you did uh, on some of this material. And um, I think a lot of people not, might not be aware of the connection between Byzantium and Russia. Uh, I, I didn't know that much about that. Could you speak to that just a little bit? Because it was something that, that historically I wasn't really aware of. Oh, <clears throat> uh, yes. Uh, the connection between Byzantium and Russia has well, it's been uh, it's been a, a complicated. Well, I mean, after the fall, I mean, we know about the the Russian fa the, the Orthodox faith, but after the fall of Byzantium, I think you had once you talked about some of the people fleeing and and some of the culture and art coming to Russia, right? Well, actually, at the fall of the and uh, let let before I answer this question, I have a really um, 
comprehensive row of slides that I would like to go through. Okay. So that will explain uh, and kind of oh, answer okay. your question and I will speak more in, in detail. So I'm showing the Paleologus dynasty coat of arms. Right. Then uh, the next shot, there is Sophia Paleologina. Uh, she was the princess and the only uh, basically surviving uh, well, one of her her brother and her they fled Constantinople that when it was overtaken by the Turks. Here you see her. Um, they did reconstruct her face uh, according to what uh, they had available, and um, uh, behind her you see uh, the flag of Byzantium. With Byzantium Empire, of course, was is is largely um, undermined by the Western. A historic uh, sort of overview. Uh, right. Always, uh, every time we talk about history of, you know, the ancient times, we always emphasized Roman Empire, and then the whole Byzantium kind of just uh, sort of like didn't even happen. But in it, actually, it's the biggest, and uh, it, it was bigger than Rome. It existed longer than Rome, right. uh, several hundred years longer, and it was a Christian empire and of an Orthodox. So it is uh, interesting how I mean you can just kind of get the elephant in, out of the room without anybody noticing. But uh, the truth is, this is the flag of the uh, Byzantine Empire with Sophia on its uh, in front of it for a reason. And here I have these maps. And uh, you can just quickly go in through them, see the map of Byzantium in uh, 1476. Then we go uh, to the next shot. And in 550, you can see it greatly expanding. Um, further exp expansion begins to then shrink into uh, the war begins, the invasion begins from the um from the eastern uh, side with the M muslim invasion of uh, byzantium that uh happens relatively quickly and in 170 you can shrink you can see the shrinking of the of the territories in 1200s uh it's uh it's pretty much uh to its third of its size and then um, we get to 1400s, it virtually is a non-existent. Uh, a little bit on the right of the Constantinople, there is this little uh, piece of land I point out to just because my uh, I have love for Georgia. And uh, this uh, trapezund uh, area is called the Trapezund Empire. At the time, uh, Saint, uh, Saint Tamara, the Queen of uh, Georgia has done tremendous uh, effort to maintain Christendom in that area. It was uh, a remarkable effort, a miracle that they had that much of a territory still uh, surviving. And she also did uh, a lot of uh, restoration of Mount Athos at the time. And that just thought, I thought I mentioned because historically it kind of gets, well, but you know, uh, uh, literally hundreds of thousands of lives were given to to still hold that that those territories in, mm -hmm. in a Christendom. And then uh, if that's, we talk about 1400, and then um, that's pretty much uh, the, the finishing point uh, and the dissolution of the empire and it's overtaken in 1453. And that's where um, um, Sophia Paleolog uh, comes to Russia. And that is a very important, uh, it's, not, uh, it's not just symbolic, it's, uh, it's basically the lineage uh, gets um, transferred as the way, the, the way at least the Russians see it for sure. Well, we have non-existent territories of what used to be the empire. And now uh, Sophia becomes this vessel of the uh, Porphyria born, purple born uh, dynasty. And she is married to Ivan III in Moscow. And her being a person, and she was in good relation, she was actually kept in Vatican at the time when they ran off, they were refuged in Vatican. And, um, and 
the you know act of her marrying off to Russia was one of the political uh, sort of situations where they were hoping to you know use Russian resources and find some diplomatic ways of you know benefiting because everybody was in, uh, very nervous about what's going on with the fall of the empire. We're not going to go into the Unia and all the other stuff that's uh, that was happening at the same time. Um, well, one one point I'd like to make that some people might misunderstand, which is that a lot on this channel, we've done a lot of critiques of the Roman Catholic view of uh, statuary and images, and they might have the impression that we that I or or people in our circles would be opposed to the Renaissance tradition or classical art or something like that, and that's simply not the case, actually. The point is to keep a, 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 the liturgical prescriptions as to what's proper in the service. That's distinct and different from what you can have in the palace or in the, you know, the art museum. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with these kinds of artistic traditions and expressions. It's different from what's proper in the liturgy according to the Seventh Ecumenical Council. So I just want to make that caveat before people are confused. Like, well, didn't you didn't you critique? Uh, no, what I critiqued was things like Sistine Chapel, which from our perspective, it's it's uh, art artistically uh, brilliant, but not proper for uh, liturgical expression. So there's a distinction I want to make there. I, I agree uh, entirely, and yes, I think it's an important, there may be a lot of points that need to be reiterated and might have to be later addressed. Uh, of course, we're, we're going through a, a, a very important territory that um, has some blurry borders, and believe me, they are, because um, when we are speaking about art, like you use a, a Sixteen Chapel as an example, uh, Michelangelo's work. Um, yes, the, uh, from an Orthodox perspective, having, you know, um, several thousand nude bodies, be they whatever purpose they serve um, in an uh, area where we perform holy uh, divine liturgy um, uh, would be by all standards of orthodoxy inappropriate and definitely distracting, definitely um, strange. However, um, not to get into that uh, too far, I would say that uh, classical uh, understanding, basically what we see is a good example of um, Sixteen Chapel. I think, you know, uh, what they're doing is they're uh, what we're doing and we're seeing academic tradition allows you to learn how to, and if you don't know how to draw a nude figure, you'll never be able to draw um, anybody the way they, you know, they will be deformed. Of course, I'm not talking about iconographic tradition right. that is very much, uh, uh, you would say it's, um, I don't want to use words simplified, it's not, it's, it's, a, it's an entirely different way of portraying, it's, right. it's, uh, it's symbolic and it's a canonical in its own format, but right. again, when we get into the word canonical, you know, when we talk about 12th century iconography, and we say that's canonical. So what, after 12th century, we see, um, particularly in Russia, and I'm going to get to that, mm -hmm. you'll see um, what, what, what could be interpreted as modernization of church art. However, there are definite um, criteria. So yes, you can just know how to draw people the way Michelangelo did, but you would still use uh, drapery, you would still dress them up, um, and that way it will be appropriate. Uh, and it was deemed appropriate by the uh, Russian Orthodox Church um, for centuries and centuries, um, and not, not all the churches look like they did in 12th century, and we'll, we'll see some examples of that. So yes, I know if that answers your question, um, yeah. there are differences and there are moments of uh, what is appropriate for a context of divine service. Yes, absolutely. Um, and so as we move on with these um, pictures, I wanted to, uh, that will illustrate some of the things I'm talking about a little further. Uh, here we have some names just because, well, uh, Aristotle Ferravanti, just to track back for a second, he was invited by Sophia Paleologos uh, into Russia. And 
beyond what they had a collapse of the cathedral uh, because the they didn't have the, the sufficient knowledge and there may have been some corruption as far as selling building materials but what they didn't have is good bricks as basic as that and they've calculated that buying bricks somewhere else was a hundred times more expensive than making their own. So one of the things that Aristotle Ferravanti did is he um, was part of building a brick factory and they made a very, very high quality, um, uh, bur it requires uh, casting them and subjecting them to a long period of fire uh, treatment that he was able to introduce. So he was a Renaissance man in many ways. He also was part of building Russian, some of Russia's first uh, artillery that they've used in a standoff against the Tartars. And actually, from some historical perspective, it played a very crucial role in Tartars not being able to cross a certain demarcation line on the river where they were prepared to take over because of the of the artillery that they had. And so the whole Tartar army of millions had to be stuck in uh, unfavorable weather and then they retrieved. And so sometimes these uh, technological things can play, you know, I mean, I don't mean like drawing a you know parallel with Hiroshima, but, you know, sometimes technology can take change the course of history uh, and for good or the bad, they obviously did not destroy any peaceful villages with those guns to make their point, but uh, the technology came forward to uh, change the course of history for sure. Now and is, that this, would... is this slides 18, 19, and 20 where you're showing the Sophia Cathedral and the imagery? Oh yes, I'm. Uh, I got. Uh, I'm still on a cathedral of uh, Archangel Michael, as an example. There are some uh, sacred geometry uh, moments there with a geometric uh, sort of uh, layouts that I'm showing. Okay, um, so seventeen. Here. Just, just very brief, briefly, um, uh, just just showing it as an example. So everything is engineered and calculated with certain harmonies, ancient, antique understandings that comes from the perennial uh, ancient uh, Greek uh, traditions, architectural right. traditions, and Byzantine traditions, of course. Um, so the church isn't just kind of put together. It has a sort of proportion uh, understanding that's based on human body, right. which is very important too. So wow. the image and likeness and the body and the microcosm and macrocosm are uh, considered and used consistently with understanding. The St. Sophia uh, model well, the temple of was the that way. So in the Old Testament, yeah. right? The uh, temple was designed as a microcosm of the human body and as the universe as well. So Jesus says, if you destroy this temple, right? Speaking of his body, I'll raise it again in three days. So that goes back even to the biblical, you know, attitude of viewing the temple as a microcosm of the macrocosm. Absolutely. And there are also interesting um, references to church also being um, like a, uh, an image of the Noah's Ark and actual yes. dimensions of Noah's Ark. And, uh, and if you like flip the Noah's Ark upside down, you would actually it'll look like a cathedral in a way. But there are a lot of other, you know, ways that um, biblical architecture is is thought uh, and uh, presented. I'm not I'm not going to get into this right now, but I'm showing some examples mm -hmm. uh, specifically of architecture because uh, that just, just gives us large examples of culture. And so St. Sophia model that I thought was uh, interesting to see that was built in Kiev uh, in uh, 111, uh, that uh, cathedral um, obviously was built in a Byzantine uh, traditional um, architectural style. Here we see a little bit more of the Kremlin complex, uh, uh, the bell tower, uh, and then I jump to um, St. Petersburg because um, uh, this is the Smolny Cathedral. Um, where I grew up. And uh, I just wanted to make a little link to this for my personal experience. And I think it's, um, it was built much later in 1746. 
However, um, it was built by an Italian um, uh, Italian architect Rastrelli, who was uh, Francesca Rastrelli, who came and worked in St. Petersburg. But um, I, um, my fascination, not just with architecture, but with art uh, in large, comes from my own personal uh, exposure to this um, uh, culture, living, and I was born in St. Petersburg uh, there, during the Soviet period when it was still called Leningrad. And uh, there was a difference, I would say. <laughs> um, and here you see the shot of the uh, Smolny Cathedral. And uh, in the next shot, there is a, a photo of myself that I recently found. Uh, that snow uh, is actually a frozen Neva River. Uh, <clears throat> and you're looking at the river. Your skis on. And I have the skis on, and behind me is a river people were able to ski on during winter time. And uh, we lived across on that side where, where I'm standing. So I grew up just looking at this uh, incredible cathedral. And, you know, a, a personal story, I ended up in St. Petersburg for the first time as ordained priest and ended up serving uh, totally without specifically programming that event. It was, I was invited um, to serve in this cathedral on the day of St. Petersburg Saints. So my first service uh, in St. Petersburg where I was born and grew up ended up in there um, on that day. So believe it or not, that's, that's how sometimes God makes his points. Wow. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, Providence, right providentially and very encouragingly to um, kind of make you feel like, you know, there's something, something is, uh, is, is being done uh, on our behalf for our own good and for good of many. So I hope that's the case. The, and the next shot I uh, showed another um, work by Rastrelli, which is another masterpiece that uh, is the uh, fountain uh, in um, Grand Palace in Peterhof, which was the basically like the uh, summer residence of the czars. And there's a famous fountain with Samson tearing apart the lion's jaws and the water gushing out. So the, there is a lot of, uh, you know, mythological imagery and things like that. There's a lot of water Right, this is like the uh, the Versailles of the Russian czars. Anyway, oh, the same architect, just as a reference. Right. Uh, what we uh, what I'm showing is again the influence of uh, French Italian architecture. Here is another building. That's the Catherine Palace in Sarskoye Selo. That's a place where a very famous Russian writer and poet grew up. And, and went to school. His name is Alexander Sergeyevich Pushkin. That's a place where, around the place where he grew up and wrote his, uh, a lot of his poetry and um, held that place dear. Of course, not the palace itself, but the, the entire area around it has most beautiful um, parks and the fall, everything turns into gold and red and, yellow, everything is uh, in incredible colors that he wrote about that he was uh, definitely uh, moved by the fall. It was one of his favorite times of year um, for, for Pushkin. So, and that's uh, where the Tsar family was actually kept for some time after their arrest as well. And after that, they were continually moved down uh, towards their um, martyrdom, which we'll touch up a little bit on. Another example by Carla Rossi is uh, 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 Alexandrine Theater in, built in 1832 in St. Petersburg. Um, and there is probably one of the most impressive uh, buildings uh, in the world, in my opinion. It's the St. Isaac's Cathedral. Um, uh, it was built by, well, designed and of course built by uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of Russian workers uh, in uh, usually the conditions for the workers back in the day were not good for anyone, not in France, not in Russia, but from our records, we know that, you know, the 
the way things were done in Russia were not the worst by any means compared to build, building of the of the uh, Versailles Palace, where there were just infinite number of victims uncounted. Um, so, with that said, I wanted to show show you this building because it's uh, it's a very profound it's very large it's um it, it's not as big as saint peter's cathedral i think it's about 20 meters shy of its height but it's still very large and very beautiful uh architectural um, gem and uh, you can see some of the different angles from which uh you can observe it i found this one interesting shot with a foot uh, uh that's far removed from it, but it just shows you when you're walking through uh, St. Petersburg, you're seeing uh, art, as, as this is true for any uh, maybe great European city, you're seeing art everywhere you look. And uh, I think it's very important. Um, and that's part of that succession. I think being exposed to that um, classical beauty um, is, uh, it does something to uh, bring uh, a sense of aesthetic into your uh, consciousness on a very deep, almost cellular level. And another thing that I wanted to add to this is when we, and that's a context uh, question, when we were growing up uh, in Russia, there in the Soviet period, uh, all of this amazing um, beauty was sort of viewed as, you know, historical heritage. But it was almost like um, subconsciously everybody knew that this was a result of spiritual, cultural process that right. for the most part, that, that's why they blew up so many cathedrals. But somehow in, in St. Petersburg, they maintained, uh, they just couldn't blow up everything. They were, they were close though. Before the World War II happened, they had plans to blow up almost anything, maybe including the St. Isaacs. Wow. And I mean, they were bothered by him because they reminded people of the glory and things that were done for the glory of God. And it just kind of reminds me of that statement um, back to uh, the Bible that, um, you know, Christ talks about uh, uh, well, when he says the, the the stones will cry out if you know if I don't speak, and I think that was was kind of happening. Uh, it's just my kind of personal sense is that the stones were crying out, and when you lived in it, it was like you look that lie in the face every day when you saw these uh, incredible uh, buildings, this incredible art, and all of it. They were trying to say it was, you know, it was a delusion of religion, of opium of the masses, and mm -hmm. just something that wasn't setting right. But believe me, nobody talked about God or religion when I was going to high school. And if you did, you wouldn't graduate. <laughs> so that was the time I was growing up. And then slowly it all kind of changed, uh, or it actually changed quite rapidly, to be uh, precise. It happened within, you know, really a very short period. And I was, I think, fortunate to witness that transformation, uh, social transformation that took place over literally five year period. And um, um, when I ended up in America, uh, it was already pretty much over at the time. So uh, it was a very um, interesting, profound time to live in, but I don't want to get to uh, into memoirs. Here are the um, shots of the St. Uh, Isaac's Cathedral from within. It definitely kind of um, resonates that similar glory of St. Peter's. However, you will see, um, and, and if you, you can see in more detail, that almost nowhere, you, you will never see any nudity. Uh, but you'll see a classical as a, as a great right. example of uh, you'll see classical art. Uh, however, it will maintain a certain propriety, certain uh, sense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, I, I don't know how do you call it, but uh, piety, um, yeah. uh, decency, uh, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. But this just shows a, a very good example of how these, the synthesis can happen 
where a spirit of orthodoxy is transferred into a very representational format of classical mm -hmm. art, right. and yet it maintains uh, maintains this uh, this beauty without you know unnecessary um, uh, things. And in the next shot, this is something that I again found as I was kind of working on this presentation uh, that's dear to me. There's a picture of my father who uh, by uh, his profession, he is actually, he was a physicist and an engineer. And um, wow. uh, at the same time, he was a, uh, his hobby uh, was to mountain climb and mountain ski. But mountain climbing, he uh, he had received the several uh, what they call grades of levels that he went to El Bruce, which is one of like fourth or fifth in the world and its height. So it's a serious ascension that he did um, in a real mountain uh, scenario. And then basically Russian engineers at the time of the Soviet period were not really paid very well. Um, it, uh, everybody, you know, the whole equality of, uh, you know, uh, people in a, in a factory could make more money than person working for, you know, an institute developing uh, secret weapons. <laughs> Basically, right. that was the kind of, uh, you yeah. know, so anyway, as being somewhat bored maybe uh, of that type of, um, uh, equalization, people uh, would seek, especially people of science, and uh, they would seek, a da not danger, but they would look into extremes, the ways that, that they could go in to experience something. They also lived in a shadow of the World War II, where all of their fathers and grandfathers went through war, and yeah. they were heroes. So all these people are looked at like, well, you, you'll never live up to that. So a lot of them would say, well, okay, and we'll, we'll go and to the highest mountain or we go into you know some kind of extremes and my father being uh, a young and adventurous man was one of them and uh, eventually that kind of came to be that there was a way to get a, a temporal uh, on the side earnings by right. working for fixing these historical uh, gigantic historical buildings and he was hired and he took me to see these uh, incredible buildings so i ended up being taken into the secret stairways and to the, the beautiful uh, cupolas and inside these um, this holy of holies so to speak this is a shot of my father cleaning the window of saint isaac's cathedral from uh, as you can see many decades of dirt there's another window where you can see him uh, in contrast, uh, him um, and his friend working on the the, um, the window cleaning from the outside, and the size of this of this window is a, a four or five story uh, house. Just the window itself. So the the size of this uh, building is amazing. There's a little shot of me learning uh, how to mountain climb from my father. Mm -hmm. He took me to. Um, this um, faraway park in uh, um, north of St. Petersburg, toward Finland, where we climbed, and that was a very um, powerful experience for for me as well. And uh, well, moving on to to uh, uh, architecture, I have an aerial shot of um, St. Peter and Paul. Uh, uh, it's a fortezza. Uh, 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 castle. Uh, it's, a, it's a military uh, location. You can see another aerial shot of that uh, a little further down. Uh, Peter the Great basically began the fortification of the city with this uh, incredible um, construction, and it did play a very important role in, in uh, taking the territories from the Swedish who were uh, moving in down the river and everything needed to be controlled through river trade and uh, the whole building of St. Petersburg was considered kind of insane because it was in a swamp uh, land but strategically it was so important that he actually insisted that they build it in that area and they were bringing rocks 
to fortify the ground for several uh, for many years, people had to, as they traveled down the river, they were actually taken um, taxes were paid not by money, but by rocks. They actually had, to, if you were taking a boat down the river, you had to bring a certain number of rocks. If you're walking, you have to bring one rock. And eventually they laid out the rocks and continued to build this incredible, uh, incredible city. What's unique about St. Petersburg too, is that unlike most European cities, it was built, uh, it was planned. It had a geometric and uh, kind of a one-time sort of blueprint where most European cities, they grew from little villages, slowly growing, growing, growing. Mm -hmm. Then in right. Paul in Paris, he uh, he cleared up the French, uh, the afraid of another revolution, he actually artificially cleared up uh, ma major roads to avoid barricades. Now this but, is a, this is a Peter and Paul fortress, which is almost kind of on an island, a little, you know, thing nestled uh, next to the mainland, I guess. Yes, it's uh, on the that's, river. That's the a, island a, is a, in the I river. I think a lot of people in America and in the West would find it odd to have a military fortress with a cathedral. <laughs> that's that's pretty awesome, but I think to the Western mind, that just seems, especially if you're a Protestant, like what? Military well, fortress with a cathedral. That's not only awesome. not only cathedral at the base of the cathedral, there is the relics of Saint Peter and Paul. Oh, that they laid down as the foundation of the city of Saint Peter, it's Peter oh. the Great's patron saint. Right. Um, so yes, it, as you know, uh, it may be even more weird to the Protestants, but that was the core, of the sort of the the central base was the presence of the saint and in his relics in that in that place and then consecration of the cathedral and then the fortress around it um of course it was the people fought not for their small uh limited ambitions but for the uh for their own sovereign territories that right. belong to their nation and uh, they felt that uh god would help them of course in in fighting for what's rightfully theirs. And Russia, of course, had many enemies um, as, as coming from different directions. Sure. Um, and uh, this, this fortress is a very great, profound example of uh, military architecture. A little bit behind it, uh, you can see a red building that kind of looks like a shoe, a horseshoe. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Uh, across the river, across the canal, yeah, the very right directly uh, across the bank, looks like a red uh, horseshoe. That's right. an artillery museum. It's a museum where all of the Russian artillery um, stuff is basically right. housed. In. So yeah, this is. Not, I don't mean to turn this into some kind of military uh, <laughs> uh, event here, but this is part of history. Here we have the the. Again, we have the Carlo Giovanni Rossi, uh, uh, the Palace Square Ensemble on St. Petersburg that's built later in 1819, 28. Um, and some uh, pictures of um, the Winter Palace, or as we know it as, as a hermitage museum um, that is of great interest to me personally because um well i had a lot of personal connection with it i'll i'll get to it a little bit down the line wanted to show you some pictures this is a unique shot of the palace square from well, you see that column in the middle well somebody mm -hmm. did right. an air shot now we have these drone shots that are just incredible with the angel on top again in the middle of it all stands the angel of god and blesses the city and the winter palace um and by the way that column stands on its own weight it doesn't have a uh it's not fixed into the oh, ground really? in the way of any kind of poles it's it's simply balanced perfectly i mean there are the engineering that goes into buildings in saint petersburg is um, incredible you also see the uh the the horse is uh, ridden uh, uh, it's also aerial not aerial but it's, yeah. it's from a roof you're seeing this thing from a roof it's uh, an amazing shot and then there's another one i found amusing from uh 
uh, winter uh, period and the same uh, from a, from a right side of the I think it's the quadriga I think it's the four courses I have to actually check but yeah I four see. courses and then again shot of uh, of Hermitage of the winter palace with some birds flying I just thought it was and a beautiful photograph uh, to share and kind of uh, resonates with that next shot with the snowflakes uh, flying because it is a cold place and this um, uh, uh, palace is called the Winter Palace. Um, you can see a little bit more of that. That's where the revolution taken place and that's when they stormed the palace oh. from this very uh, point and uh, taken over the government at the mm -hmm. time of the unfortunate events of the revolution. Here is a little shot with a carriage just to give us a kind of sense of antiquity. And I thought this was a beautiful shot from Neva River where you can see the St. Isaac Cupola and the Hermitage and the Frozen River. Yeah. Wow. Uh, again, um, there are other buildings in there. Uh, another shot, this is the uh, what they call the arrow of the St. Basil's Island. Uh, with the two columns, um, uh, red columns that uh, have uh, designs of uh, front parts of the ships. So this was all about uh, navigation and Navy and um, development of Russians, uh, Russia's uh, uh, sea uh, domain. And oh, yeah. Wow. A very important strategically for Russia was to maintain its navy, which it still does actually quite well. Um, and uh, well, I guess we, we got enough shots of the Winter Palace. I, it's so important for me in this conversation, at least, um, is because of, uh, well, uh, the meaning of art uh, and uh, the collection of Winter Palace of the Hermitage Museum is one of the largest in the world. I think it has, I was surprised to find out that it has um, something close to 7 million artifacts. Well, of course, artifacts are considered to be not just pictures on the wall, but everything that right. is considered to be an artifact in there. And it's several square miles of, of floors and storage and uh, uh, but it's an amazing collection a lot of it was looted during the revolution <clears throat> but uh, a lot of it was returned regardless uh, the collection is just incredible and uh, before I take off into that direction maybe you want to interrupt me and uh, well I just wanted to make sure that so this is the inside interior images of the Hermitage Museum right Yes, this is the interior image. This is the <clears throat> the the the, st the entry staircase that we see okay. as we enter Hermitage Museum, which was also, of course, the Winter Palace residence right. of the Czars, right. and that's where all the political events <clears throat> taken place. And if you have seen, or maybe if you haven't, I highly recommend the movie by uh, Sakurov, which is called The Russian Ark. Yes, um, it was a first historically it was a first movie at the time it was almost uh, it was the most cutting edge technology they filmed it uh, yeah, with yeah, a yeah. HD camera but more than that they filmed it it's the only movie that they filmed without a single cut right. so it's a continuous shot, continuous shot that goes into the holes of Hermitage and it's set up in such a brilliant way that each hole has some historic reference to what happened uh, in there in actual reality of historic events and it's like you have this sort of uh, surreal time lapse of history kind of reflecting to Tarkovsky's idea of yeah. movies being conserved time Sakurov is definitely one of the I would say pupils of, of Tarkovsky but he's again it's that kind of uh, succession so he's taking that into the next level and uh, and making this unique film that was only possible I think because of the hermitage context and history brilliantly uh, filmed and very very interestingly yeah it's a, it's a great movie I recommend it many times as as well as people watch uh, Rublev too, which kind of also tells the history of Russia in a bunch of kind of symbolic ways. One um, of my favorite films ever. 
So uh, before we progress, uh, one thing I did want to ask that came to mind was that I think you mentioned you were kind of alluded to it, but I'd watched a documentary some years ago on St. Petersburg and they discussed how uh, it, 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 it's supposedly the case, and I want to get your, your take on this because you would know that a lot of the techniques that were used to create a lot of the columns and, and the, the architecture that some of that can't actually be redone. Is that true or is that an exaggeration? Uh, well, I think it's important to specify which are uh, what they're talking about, but I know yeah, years for, ago. I for a fact I know that there are certain things like in St. Isaac's Cathedral where we have these columns that are made from solid uh, pieces of granite that are just, you know, they're, they're humongous. They're, they're like five story building size. Uh, I mean, I don't know what they can or cannot do now. Or uh, there was a shot back then in the presentation of St. Peter on a big rock. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, riding a horse, I think there was, or maybe we'll get to it, but that rock, for example, is called the Thunder Rock, and uh, uh, they found that rock chipped off by a uh, by a lightning, and it's a solid piece of rock. It's it's like I don't remember how many tons it's it's weighed, and and how they transported it from where it was found, it was literally like 100 miles away. They rolled it. And I mean, there are a lot of different uh, engineering fit fits that were performed that just are mind boggling. I don't know exactly uh, what things we could or couldn't do these days. All I know is that uh, whatever we build nowadays falls apart in about 50 years at best. Right. Uh, everything that you see in Europe or in many things in St. Petersburg, you know, were made 500 years, uh, 300 years. In, well, in St. Petersburg, 300 years. But you look at Moscow and other places in Europe and uh, and even Rome, of course, you see the Colosseum, you know, standing through earthquakes and fires and uh, things like that. So, yeah, I think we're in some ways we're declining. <laughs> Maybe. Exactly. Well, right. Hence the idea of trying to maintain that succession that you're talking about. Yes. Um, and it's, I mean, in some areas, it may be monumental architecture. It's, uh, it may, may not happen, but I, 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 my focus is on what you can do in front of you right. on, a, on, an, on an easel and, uh, or on a drawing board, which is a lot less uh, grandiose, but it's uh, something that anybody can uh, still for now. And I want to emphasize that because the whole purpose of this conversation uh, is to not allow this to pass away. And it, it is passing away as, as rapidly as uh, as a snow in the spring. Anyway, so we are, um, if you want to continue this, I don't yeah, want you to wanna get into the interior images here. Real quick. Yes, I will speed up because I realize we don't have, you know, all day, but uh, there are some shots of the gallery, what they call the gallery of the 332 portraits of generals of the Patriotic War of 1812, which was the war with Napoleon. They actually have one of this, these amazing corridors with uh, this many portraits, the beautiful portraits. And um, that's a commemoration of that war. And uh, that was an important uh, event in history of the world. Let's say, I wanna get too far into that history, but again, Kutuzov, who was the general commander of the army was also a very religious man. We just celebrated Kazan, Mother of God, icon memory of that uh, feast. He prayed to Kazan, Mother of God, every day. Mm. And uh, his, uh, you know, he definitely attributed his victory to uh, divine help, as many other, Ru at least Russian um, commanders did. Mm -hmm. I wanna, uh, maybe we can do a, a whole other you know, meeting on that because it's very interesting as the lives of Russian admirals and and Russian commanders and, and right. literally their their 
their lives were like the lives of saints, which is kind of strange to hear. Wow. Like, oh, you know, you order people to die. How do you? Do? But that's that's a very interesting, you know, life right. experience that we can we can maybe make a point of talking about. And some of them actually made saints, but canonized saints by the Russian Church. Right. And uh, there are some more interior shots as we get to this uh, picture of um, a young artist making a copy, a copy of a, a classical art uh, piece in, Saint, in, in Hermitage. And the copy practice is uh, an extremely important part of classical training, except it's not a photocopying, it's understanding of the technique, it's understanding of, of the way it actually was created. It's not just simply painting by numbers, Right. Uh, trying to just, you know, be a print copy machine that is, you know, just trying to replicate, uh, replicate, which, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you Not know, uh, ink on the surface of, uh, of, of a canvas, but actually understands the form. And that is another discussion I hope we'll get to eventually. This is a great example of copying practice in St. Petersburg Hermitage. In Florence, we do exactly the same. We're fortunate to do it in other museums right. like Palazzo Pitti uh, and other great museums like Uffizi and you name it. There's some exhibits uh, shot and uh, we are arriving at uh, an interesting point in our conversation. I specifically picked it as a little intermission. This is a pavilion room, the white columns with a thing you can see on the left of a, of a very large chandelier is a golden cage like um, structure in the yep. left that houses a peacock uh, and other uh, mechanical uh, machines uh, that are animals. Uh, it's a very cool um, uh, thing that was gifted to or, or purchased by the Russian court that the, the made by a British uh, master, his name is uh, John Cox, uh, and he was one of the unique uh, mechanical masters of Europe, and he made this incredible thing. For me as a young uh, boy going to, Saint, uh, to the museum, it just so happened that um, I got to see it very often. Uh, and um, it was very amusing. For most people who come to Hermitage, it is also very amusing and very beautiful. Um, I would like us to take a look at a little short film yep. that is about three minutes long that uh, I kind of put together from different things and you get to see this clock in uh, action. So let's look, let's look at the film.
Now that we looked at the film, um, I wanted to say a few things. There, um, I, I think it's entertaining, but also there's something more to it. First of all, of course, it has all these symbolisms. The, the peacock, uh, well, it represents, uh, in some traditions, it even represents a resurrection and uh, transformation. And some say it eats poisonous seeds and has a color because of that poison, it transforms the poison into, into beauty. Some uh, symbolism of the actual um, uh, structure, it has four mechanisms that are uh, wound up together and they work separately and together there is a vocal uh, mechanism there is a rotation of the actual peacock the tail uh, the tail is golden on one side and silver on the other representing night and day and it had all these different colored uh, lacquers that were put over the metal so they actually created this effect of the peacock uh, sort of a holographic type of um, spectrum of light, very beautiful and very fine stuff that some of it didn't actually make it to this day. But the clock is the oldest working mechanism of this size in the world. And um, they only turn it on once a week. And uh, the, uh, the the sequence of the animals too, the, the owl wakes up first because it's the nighttime animal. Then there's a waking up of the peacock and waking up of the of the the the, uh, the dragonfly and other things it's, it's very amazing but the uh, reason why i kind of got too far into it is um, it's kind of symbolic of what happened for russia we're always talking here about how european masters came to russia and how russia was sort of behind and how they ended up uh, building russia i don't want to get a wrong idea that russia sort of is uh, you know, very profane, and they had no uh, abilities of their own. In right. fact, the talents of the Russian land uh, are countless, and I, and that's another story that uh, we can talk about forever. Yeah. But this peacock story is an example um, when it arrived, when it was purchased with Catherine the Great's fund, it arrived in, from England. Um, it came, it, it fell apart in uh, trans transportation and they didn't know how to put it back together and there was one genius russian mechanic named kulibin who was a, a boy born in a village somewhere uh, far away from the big city eventually came to saint petersburg and was already re a reputable chat uh, clock master so what happens is they bring him these three baskets of of just just parts and apparently some of the parts were mixed some of the parts were missing and it's all he had it's all he had to work with and he actually spent four years i think um putting it together from wow. from rumble and <laughs> making parts that were missing so it was almost probably easier to just make it but nevertheless it was one of like uh, such examples where some things coming from the West were really refined and sometimes uh, imitated by Russians better than the originals wow. and sometimes right. overlooked and nobody took the credit. No, the people who worked on these things would did not get credit, uh, but the names of the, you know, the original authors, of course, make it into history. So it's important uh, piece of information I wanted to share as a, as a kind of a pattern sometimes that happen in Russia very often. Yeah, that's, that's great. Go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, uh, did you want to move to the to the czar? Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, one word to say about my personal connection to Hermitage. I ended up, and I value that tremendously. I ended up going to Hermitage um, Museum as a student of art history for two years. Uh, I got into. A youth um, art history class that was uh, allowing me the access with no lines uh, into the Hermitage Museum. And um, every uh, week I would travel from, I lived where you, you saw the Smolny Cathedral. It yeah. took me about 40 minutes to get to Hermitage. <laughs> and I would spend after school several hours just kind of floating around and oh, going wow. to lectures. 
um, and sometimes not going to lectures, but kind of feeling like uh, when you see the Russian uh, arc, that kind of feeling of almost like a ghost going through these uh, corridors and uh, inside this uh, incredible uh, contrast of what was going out outside at the time in my youth. It was a, a you know right. a gray, a gray reality with Soviet idols painted, you know, pictures of Lenin and Stalin, sometimes size of a you know five story building, and the statues of the of the revolutionary uh, heroes. Right. Uh, and that was what surrounded us. And when I ended up coming in there, it was really like going inside a uh, an ark. I felt like I was transported into an entirely different world and was fortunate to be in that world, escape into the world for several years before uh, I actually, uh, my, my family took me to America. But that's my personal uh, a bit. And I ended up coming there a lot to see that Peacock um, performance. So that was always, and it happens, by the way, if you decide to go see it, Make sure that you check because it only happens once a week. They mm -hmm. wind it up and allow it to, to perform only once a week. At the time I was going, it was actually on that day, so I got to see it every time. But if you come to St. Petersburg, you want to uh, Google and find out the day that they will do it if you want to see it in live. And it's quite a special. I was thinking of the the closest thing in Memphis <laughs> that, that's comparable to that. Have you ever seen the Ducks in Memphis? No, I haven't been to Memphis. It's not it's not comparable. But so if you go to Memphis, there's a, a famous hotel called the Peabody. And it, it's funny because they have ducks that ride the elevator every day. And they come wow. from the top floor and they walk to the big uh, uh, pool in the middle of the hotel inside indoor and they swim all day. And then at seven o'clock at night or whatever, they walk back to the elevator and ride the elevator back up. They, it's just something ridiculous that they're that mechanical. I, no. I, they're real oh, ducks. They're real I'm just ducks. being silly. I'm being silly here. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> it just reminded me of what's what's the closest thing I've seen to that in in, in America, and it made me think of the ducks that you have. Oh. But you have to. It's it's a big event. People come from all over, and they and they do it every day. They come in, and there's a big crowd of people, and they watch the ducks ride the elevator. It's just something silly I was bringing. Oh, okay. That no, well, it's, it's it sounds like you know. Of, of course, these this this clock is uh, definitely an amusement uh for uh, you know for royal family but for everybody who came to visit um and uh entertainment uh well i bet at the royal time people. it would have been like right like uh you know a sight to see right yes yes and um a lot of people visited hermitage uh from all over the world before it became a state museum and uh now we're it was definitely the home of the royal family and we right. can see, um, I found the shot of the, what they call the St. George Hall, the great throne room, uh, mm -hmm. where a lot of um, very important meetings were held when they entertained, uh, uh, you know, political uh, guests and uh, royalty and right. um, uh, attaches of other countries. Uh, in that room, uh, ballroom events happened. Yes, correct. Um, yes, yeah, so I was showing the throne room, and then I, um, I found this um, wonderful portrait of Tsar Nicholas II in that same room, painted by Ilya Repin, who is definitely one of the greatest later um, Russian classical uh, traditional artists, painters. And um, uh, the topic of the royal family, of course, is very close to um, well, heart of uh, all Orthodox, uh, especially Russian Orthodox people, of course, but I know that, uh, you know, even relationship with Greece at the time when he was a youth, <clears throat> he traveled across the world with the prince of the future king of uh, Greece, uh, George, who actually allegedly saved his life and 
uh, a terrorist attack in Japan when they were attacked by a uh, swordsman. He actually huh. deflected the sword that was aimed at say, Tsar Nicholas. Oh, wow. And um, uh, I think that relationship, I don't know if you know about that story, but uh, no, I didn't know that. Throw it in. But uh, just to say that, uh, you know, it's not just entirely Russian uh, history, it's a history of Orthodox uh, world, it's a history of, of the world in general. And uh, we could talk about royal family, obviously, for a very long time. We just recently had the, the mem memory day of their martyrdom on the 17th of July. And, uh, you know, speaking about them, and as I was preparing this presentation, it kind of, uh, say it dawned on me, but I, I was filled with a sense of appreciation of, uh, of a kind of gratitude that I felt for being uh, able to go to their home after, you know, their death, of course, but as a youth, I spent so much time and I realized, hey, I was, I was coming to their home and I was uh, given uh, sort of this welcome um, and I, I started to see it as that from this perspective now that I'm uh, serving. I've, I've heard you tell a lot of stories. I, you never told that one, so I didn't know that. That's fascinating. Which one? That you had spent so much time there. Yes, and I think it was very formative, uh, right. to be honest, in this whole conversation about modern versus uh, uh, traditional classic. When I ended up in America um, uh, applying and going to art schools, and I was, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to name them right now, just um, there's several, and I went to several art schools, I, um, I felt deep sense of frustration um because um yeah there was no connection to the tradition um uh, in a practical sense there was simply no knowledge no training no school mm -hmm. in russia at the time where i left it uh, that tradition remained in its probably most competitive form at the time and uh, here in america it, there was just it, no knowledge of academia in uh, classical art almost entirely at least wherever i tried it was always um reduced to very very maybe to art history to some elements of theory but never to practice so yeah. yes when i was shown these things and told this is what we're gonna do i was saying well can we do this uh, and they would say well, we can't because it's not important anymore or let's be honest, we just simply can't <laughs> because we don't know how to. Uh, and that was a shock because it still exists. Like right. here, it's sort of been buried and forgotten in a way of and accepted. Like we already served, you know, we, we buried it. It's it's over. It's it's great. You can come to the grave and look at it in the museum, but um, it's not the case. It's not true. Uh, and uh, so uh, we'll get to that topic a little bit down the line hopefully soon i'm gonna speed up this process here is um a painting that i find very uh, powerful it's a, it's obviously a kind of a sketch sort of painting it's not a full-on uh you know refined uh finished portrait but it has this incredible presence of sir nicholas in red in actually a royal scots um uh, uniform holding the you know the the hat and uh, just a very uh, expressive work by Serov, who is one of the also later Russian masters, um, undoubtedly. These are examples of uh, classical painting in the 20th, 19th, 20th century, um, the beginning of the 20th century. And here I have a, a, a recolored, uh, a very well colored, I, I think, photograph of the royal family. Um, as they looked in 1913, not too long before their um, their uh, martyrdom, uh, and uh, just looking at these people and their examples of their lives, and there's a lot of lies that surround the, the propaganda against them right. that was launched in in the West and in uh, obviously in Soviet Russia, which is another whole topic. Um, and again, we don't have time for, but. I just want to show my appreciation and honor for these really uh, incredible people. Um, their letters, their behavior, their documents of their lives, of their deeds speak louder than you know any words. And 
it definitely uh, is a blessing to be part of the church that um, I am serving in, the Russian Orthodox Church outside of Russia that was first um, to, uh, to glorify them in, uh, uh, as saints. And it happened in, 18, in 1981. And then interestingly enough, at the time when it happened, Russia was still going strong in a Soviet uh, a paradigm. And I believe it was in the 1980s was where there was the, the Olympic Games. And Russia was the center of the Olympic Games. And it was sort of the Soviet Russia was sort of coming into the uh, global arena as this you know, happy country of democracy and uh, whatever Soviet or not. And the uh, church here outside of Russia all of a sudden you know, it was almost like a um, a call to conscience, a reminder that yeah. this country is built on blood of martyrs, of the kings that were ordained to guide their people and the uh, custodians of the land uh, that were ordained by God were murdered in cold blood and then there we have Russia sort of saying, no, forget all about it. It's OK. Um, and then the well, Soviet Russia. And then uh, I just thought about that correlation because Olympics are always a symbol of sort of restoration of some harmony and peace. <clears throat> and after that, Russia, interestingly enough, within literally less than a decade, comes to a total collapse and restoration of the church. And then we have in 19... 91, we have the uh, then the recognition of the royal family by the Moscow Patriarchate, right. and they are then uh, um, uh, also brought in as uh, now and uh, accepted as saints by the Russian church starting in 91. So it only took like nine years. That's remarkable to change the entire paradigm yeah. of history in the world. And I think these things are kind of connected in my mind, at least. So I thought of, uh, you know, I wanted to say a few words about royal family. And here we can see one of the Orthodox icons of the royal family, of which there are many, shows them in traditional Russian czar uh, attire um, as those uh, czars that we speak about as the succession of the Byzantium into Russia. And I kind of didn't say as much on that topic as I wanted to, but just a word or two as far as that transition of the Byzantium the empire that you show you saw shrinking then kind of being taken up and reignited in Russia as the land of the orthodox faith of Christian faith right. and its role in the global sort of uh, as a global power that is still maintaining uh, its uh, identity as an Orthodox Christian country, of which there are so few left, or at least with that uh, level of global influence politically right, right. and uh, strategically. So we'll see, we're seeing something happening, I hope, that is bringing not just, you know, Russia, not in a sense of an enemy or, or uh, a rival, but in the sense of presence of Christ's uh, right. teachings in the country itself. Absolutely. And that is, um, and then here we see in the next shot, actually, the church inside the Winter Palace uh, that is uh, that was used by the royal family when they were attending services uh, in their palace. And uh, the next shot is sort of a, a, a little switch to Italy now and to a big celebrity of the uh, of the art world, I don't know if you can tell from afar. I specifically took the shot of um, of a Madonna and um, and a child. You know if you can recognize it right off the bat. But when we zoom in, we can see um, one of Da Vinci's masterpieces, uh, Madonna Lita. Um, and some sources that's attributed to Leonardo in. Uh, in some resources, very reputable resource, including Hermitage collection is um, unquestionably uh, confirms it to be uh, authentic Leonardo painting, uh, which is very beautiful. And then speaking of birds, you'll notice a little, uh, little uh, if, if you look closer, you'll see a 
him holding a little goldfinch in his hand. Uh, the Christ uh, is holding a goldfinch it's under their next to mm -hmm. mother's body. And maybe you can see the head of a little bird. And um, goldfinch is some is a bird that, and, and interestingly enough, made it into so many Italian paintings that it's. Um, uh, I would I would just say two words about it. Uh, you have Medici's uh, baby, um, uh, who then became the uh, he became the pope. But uh, when he was a, a little boy, there's a painting by Bronzino when he's um, holding goldfinch in his uh, in his hand kind of squeezing them, but the, there are, the listen to those numbers, there's like over 400 and a half paintings in religious art that have a goldfinch in them. And uh, they're made by like 250 artists. And out of those 250 artists, like 215 are from Italy. So for some reason, it was a very popular a uh, bird in Italy to portray. And the, one of the explanations as to what it symbolizes is that it feeds on the seeds of a milk thistle, which looks like and was associated with the crown of thorns of Christ. Oh, so okay. that bird represents uh, symbolically, and I love symbolism, and I think art with uh, symbolism, well, all the classical art has some symbolism in it. Right. But I think that yeah. language of symbols is um, also important to, to be maintained, to be kind of kept alive, or maybe we can introduce our own new symbols, but generally uh, symbolism is, a, is an important part of art, in my opinion, and right. I, I like to talk about symbolism in art very much. So that little beautiful uh, bird uh, played uh, is a very, very famous uh, part of many uh, Da Vinci's and other very big painters. Uh, so moving on, now I see that uh, shot with St. Peter, uh, not St. Peter, but Peter the Great on a horse on a rock. That mm -hmm. is the one I was talking about. That's the, they call it the thunder rock. That's the piece of the, you actually don't see the whole thing and it goes all down in the shot, but that was done by a French sculptor too. It's a, one of the landmarks of, of uh, St. Petersburg, but it took a lot of effort to get that rock across wow. to the Neva River. Right. So this kind of concludes the, the excurs into St. Petersburg that I, I hope you enjoyed. And then we have a couple more things uh, in regards to Italy and our art project in Italy that if you would like to say a few words now. Please. Yeah, sure, go ahead. Dual means. Do, do you have any questions about it? Well, no, I know that, so uh, you want to get into the origins and you want to get into the um, what we're uh, looking at with the Florence School, the Florence Academy, and, and you wanted to, you know, if you want to go through those slides now. Yes. Um, <clears throat> so now this whole trajectory, I would like to demonstrate in quick terms about, uh, you know, Russian classical school. Well, and hold on a second. So uh, I forgot I had notes. Yeah, you're right. So so you talk, let's see, um, we've gone through the succession. We've gone through the different uh, pseudo classical uh, critique that you had of what's not actually classical, which is, uh, you know, scanning and repeating. And yeah, I mean, on that topic, of the Russian I mean, classical just, tradition. If, oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt. No, it's okay. I wanted to say more about it, but I would, if we do get a chance to talk about it later, because it's, it's a, it's a bit of, you know, it requires a little more attention than just making right. these blatant statements. Um, and I would like to explain the difference. But I don't think we have we can explain everything in one. Yeah, we can do another interview for sure. Did you want okay. to get to the geometry okay. of Renaissance yeah. work now and the and the the school, or do you want to save that for another? another um, I would like to first show a little bit about the academic succession in general okay. and its uh, movement across Europe, okay. and we'll then uh, just a few words about geometry because again, it's another topic okay. that. It will not be contained within this interview. Um, <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, so moving uh, along this uh, pre prepared, we have a view of Florence, which is rightfully called the cradle of Renaissance. It really um, is an amazing place that gave birth to uh, a whole <clears throat> uh, classical arts culture. And quickly going through the origins of the academic, specifically I'm talking about the academic tradition, which is what creates artists and allows artists to continue to develop. One of the people here at the roots of it is Giorgio Vasari because he was one of the, the main art critics, uh, art historians, but also one of the founders of the first uh, art academy as we know it in Florence. And uh, the person who helped him was Cosima di Medici, whom you see here. Uh, portrait and uh, the next shot is the actual uh, building of the Accademia delle Arti where all of it sort of began on Piazza San Marco. Um, interestingly enough, right across is the Monastery San Marco with uh, a famous reference to somebody you would definitely know about as uh, Savonarola was uh, in that monastery. Huh. Um, and, and there's another interesting saint that uh, kind of resonates with the whole Florence Orthodoxy connection is uh, Saint Maximus the Greek, who played a very important role in bringing, uh, he studied and lived in Florence for four years and was living in San Marco without becoming Catholic, because mm -hmm. at the time it was like, a you know, it was like going to uh, an Oxford University or uh, right. you know, University of Paris and studying theology doesn't, it didn't mean that you became uh, Catholic, but after that he went to Russia and it's a very interesting story of his life that may be worth attention, but that's that connection between Orthodoxy Florence and, mm -hmm. um, and San Marco. <laughs> anyway, I don't want to get too crazy with these associations, but literally right behind uh, the, the photography uh, point that you're looking at the academy is the is that St. Marco Monastery, if you mm -hmm. ever come uh, to Florence and see, I have a shot of the uh, David with other uh, masterpieces by Michelangelo on the sides is later uh, more on, as they call unfinished works. It was questionable if it's unfinished or intentional. And there's some couple of shots of what the workshops looked like not going to have, uh, we're not going to go deep into it, but basically this engraving of 16th century shows a uh, workshop or an uh, academy uh, setting of them studying anatomy, studying uh, casts, studying sculpture, studying figure drawing, and so mm -hmm. on. And then we're moving into later uh, examples from 18th, 19th century of an artist's studio actually painted by uh, Russian artist uh, Mary um, uh, Bash Bashkirtsev, and uh, she died rather young, but she did paint the, um, you see a, a, a boy uh, model, right, and uh, many women uh, painting, that's that's the painting I'm referring to. <clears throat> it's a it's a basically a, a painting of what the studio looked like mm -hmm. in 18th, end of, end of, beginning of 19th century. Uh, another one of a uh, rather quick painting by Lia Repin of a model that uh, artists are painting in their studio. Uh, just examples of studio environment that I wanted to show. And um, now I uh, prepared this interesting sequence of uh, academies or academic schools that then emerged from these workshops and bottegas of masters. <clears throat> and I began chronologically when in 1752, Royal Academy of Fine Arts in, uh, of, of San Fernando in Madrid was established. That's basically the one after uh, Florentine Academy, uh, chronologically um, in, in uh, mid 18th century, um, beginning uh, and 17th century. Then uh, interestingly, St. Petersburg Academy was established only a couple of years later. And that's, um, you're seeing a shot across the Never River of the St. Petersburg Royal Academy of Art. There's a little bit of a close up, 
was done in uh, uh, under the patronage of Catherine the Great and with direct involvement of Count Ivan Shuval. They have uh, basically uh, began the process of um, academia in St. Petersburg at that time. The next one I, I'm showing is um, Dresden Academy, which is then only 1764. So we have these academies starting to show up across Europe. And then the next one in 60, 1768 in London. So you can see how actually Russia's uh, academic school was relatively early on uh, present in the map, on the map. Interestingly, um, the one in Paris was established in 1816. And another very prominent Russian art academy in uh, St. Petersburg, that's called the Stiglitz Academy, was uh, built with sponsorship of, uh, of Baron Alexander von Stiglitz, who is a very interesting, a very interesting character. Uh, he was the founder of what we now know as Bank of Russia and sponsored the Trans-Siberian uh, and uh, Moscow St. Petersburg railroads. And he uh, was responsible for gathering funds for the Krim, Crimea war at the time when it was happening. So there's a very prominent political economic figure uh, in Russian uh, history, it was uh, main uh, right hand of the czars for the funding of major projects. And also the, the famous major, economist. I wonder if Joseph Stiglitz is a relative of the famous economist. Oh really? I'm I'm asking. I don't know. I wonder if he is. It would he make could sense. Be. Then we could be. It could run in a family. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know all of the relatives, but I certainly was um, not surprised. But I was I was pleasing to see that <coughs> the patronage of the arts and the tradition of Medici uh, is extended in this way. Um, for uh, this uh, fine person who has uh, helped the economy of Russia, but also uh, designated uh, some serious funds to building of this um, mm. art academy in, uh, in St. Petersburg for arts and crafts. And as a matter of fact, if you see a cupola of glass, uh, actually my father was also responsible for cleaning that. And I went with him uh to that building and set on top of that whole glass dome and it was a quite a memory of seeing saint petersburg um, from that perspective and you can see some beautiful shots inside that academy that's what our academies hopefully will look like in the future as well um, not only in saint petersburg but just shows you the, the level of craftsmanship investment and uh, aesthetic uh, these are all right. Uh, going to, these are all shots of the Stiglitz Academy in St. Petersburg. Uh, just wanted to give you the scope of this uh, incredible building. And uh, the next one is uh, Surikov Academy, Surikov Institute. That was the, uh, definitely a modern um, shift. Uh, it was built in 1939. Surikov, uh, it, it, it wasn't necessarily at the high rise of Surikov's career. He was contemporary of Repin. And um, there is one of the affiliates in Kazan. I'm just kind of going through this. There's a portrait of Surikov painted by Repin. Ilya Repin painted him in, uh, I think, 1877. Uh, and uh, um, there's a monumental work of Surikov's just to show you um, as a lady on the horse slate uh, as a historical event. It's a very large painting, um, uh, it's size of an entire wall. It's in uh, Tretikov collection in Moscow. And then I found this interesting, um, uh, I think it's a gouache or watercolor of Milan Cathedral that Surikov painted. That just kind of takes us back to the idea that all of the Russian masters, they traveled to Italy, they lived in Italy for years sometimes and painted and got uh, a lot of inspiration and right. training in Italy, even after they've been established artists. 
wow. the next one of the many mental artists uh, of, of grand importance, Ilya Repin, in whose name actually Russian Academy, Royal Academy of Arts in St. Petersburg was renamed during the Soviet period mm. because they couldn't call it the Royal Academy. So they oh, named yeah. it after Ilya Repin. Uh, huh. I did not pull a lot of his paintings, uh, but I did pick one of St. Nicholas um, that he painted where St. Nicholas is stopping the sword of um, a prosecutor who is about to prosecute an innocent victim as um, part of the life story of St. Nicholas that we, um, in the church um, yeah. services, we mention a lot. And uh, a lot of people pray to him for uh, justice and righteousness. Uh, and I think Repin's painting was sort of aimed at uh, this message uh, of uh, human rights and things like that, which uh, was reflected in his work. And the next great major artist that I want to share briefly is uh, Karl Brilop. His uh, monumental work, The Last Day of Pompeii, was painted in Italy. He actually yes. went to Italy after he graduated with a golden medal from St. Petersburg Royal Academy. I got was, to see you do a presentation on that and you deconstructed all the symbolism. It was fascinating. Correct. Yes, yeah, so there's a, a, an extensive work that will probably take me an hour. Uh, right. which I will eventually hopefully into, yeah. give yeah. as a lecture format on geometric analysis of this, the first day of the Russian brush as a matter of fact, and it was given to the royal family and was sponsored by Demidov family, who uh, at the time lived in, in Italy. And Brulov spent four years working on this monumental work and the size of it is 21.3 by 15 feet. Wow. Um, it's an incredible classical uh, masterpiece statement with a political um, connotation or apocalyptic sort of, uh, right you know, message in a way, but it's not, uh, well, it's not a sabotage message. It's a message of warning or of, uh, of an importance to understand the fleeting nature of, of time and the importance of uh, detachment from the material vanishing goods right. that you can see kind of crumbling and being destroyed. But then uh, uh, the next shot actually showed the, there's the same horse that you can see here, he uses, uh, uh, there's a, a horse portrait of, um, of Demidov, the, the main sponsor of the work. <clears throat> uh, he worked in Florence and that one is in Palazzo Pitti. And a horse is almost life-size. It's a very grand portrait um, made by Brulov. But interestingly enough, which would be uh, something you would resonate with, Jay, is um, the fact that Brulov went to uh, Rome and spent two years copying uh, the School of Athens in Vatican, uh, the work that's infamous and obviously dear to all the, all the philosophers. <clears throat> so imagine, you know, graduating and going to Rome and living in literally in the museums of Vatican, uh, not living, but visiting constantly and painting an exact copy of the School of Athens tells you uh, the depth of um, understanding of classical culture right. that artists had, which I cannot overemphasize in importance of um, knowledge and understanding of philosophy and theology and culture and history that made these great artists who they were. Right. And, um, they're, uh, and a need to travel to the places where these incredible masterworks are still preserved right. and working with that tradition. Um, okay, so quickly moving down past Brulov to, um, oh, there's a Emperor Nicholas and Alexander II, an artist's studio. It's another story I'm not going to get into. Uh, and the next, there's a mystery portrait that I don't want to name, but you can see this sort of um, it looks almost like a Dutch portrait, mm -hmm. the man with the mustache and um, kind of Rembrandtish, right. Dutchish looking. Well, uh, <clears throat> a very unlikely suspect, um, that person is Kazimir Malevich, who uh, everybody knows. And that is painted a year before his death. Hmm. 
Wow. And uh, kind of shows that actual homage that he pays to the classical tradition. And it's not entirely just his portrait. There's a portrait of his wife, which is done in a kind of a suprematist, but at the same time, almost like an early Renaissance tradition. And the further, we have a portrait in 93. All of those are later works where he almost looks like, with him holding his hand like this, where he looks like a Venetian merchant, maybe <laughs> from like a Carpaccio painting or something yeah, like that. Yeah. A very clear reference to Italian Renaissance aesthetic. I mean, blatant. And then I, I found, I put a little square in there. You see that it's, it's there, it's geometrically there. Yeah. He is holding his square. His square was a revelation, in his opinion, of um, you know many deep sort of uh, processes and design concept of suprematism and other new revolutionary concept. But it's interesting how towards the end of his life he arrives at the at a very different uh, aesthetic. He's going back to roots, the nostalgia for the. Uh, for the Italian or any kind of classical tradition it shows through because uh, the black square that you can see that I'm flipping through now 1915 so we talk about 20 years down the line he's going back to to the to the to classics yep. um, and uh, this probably concludes the whole trajectory of things that I kind of paste together the background image that I use for my presentation sort of as a with all due respect I want to reduce it to wallpaper I wanted to show it as a this is a Peter Bruegel by the way it's an engraving uh, on the way to Imaus uh, the three people walking in that engraving as uh -huh. Christ in the, in the oh. pop. okay uh, so yeah I, I really like I like this work it has a symbolic meaning you could talk about it more but obviously it's the path that um, hopefully it encourages us to take and yeah. with right. Christ and towards him. And um, here uh, we see some scenic shots of Florence as I move into what we're doing in Florence in the Florence Classical Arts Academy. You're seeing the Ponte Vecchio Bridge and other bridges of Florence. Most of them were blown up by Germans during World War II, but they did save Ponte Vecchio. Um, even they have appreciation uh, for things um, beautiful. So mm -hmm. here we have uh, the story, quick story of our of our school in Florence. It was uh, founded in uh, 2009, officially founded, though we did workshops around Florence before we actually had um, a location. And uh, you see some of our uh, work room environment um painting portrait and um plein air uh shots it's a quick mm -hmm. run through i will show you a couple of works by our um uh, faculty and students uh there's a portrait of what uh, looks like looks like abraham and yeah. some pencil drawing some uh a la prima painting technique that emerges a little later in classical art Ella Prima is when you paint into wet paint, where it's not layer by layer, that has more of a, a iconographic sort of mm -hmm. roots from the Middle Ages and on. Uh, the Ella Prima is emerging in the uh, art painting later on. And this is a fine example of the portrait. Everything is sort of fluid and moving, but yet it's still realistic. Uh, it's still very painterly. There are some more uh, fine examples of classical drawing. Uh, one of our students' uh, biblical illustration. By the way, one of the reasons why I feel so strongly in involvement with the academy is that uh, it's not a religious school, but <clears throat> one of its uh, sort of mottos is still to, um, you know, it's, it's still to glorify God and art. Um, you don't have to be orthodox or necessarily a Christian to be part of this school, but the uh, people who found it, people who run it now, one of them is director, my dear friend, Nadezhda Malugova, she uh, is a definitely um, a, a believer, a Christian woman with very um, clear vision that her purpose of establishing this academy was also to fill the vacuum 
of uh, spiritual uh, Christian subject matters in art, which are right. almost entirely now um, absent in established art schools or even discouraged. Let's put it straightforward that way. Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes, so uh, as uh, we mentioned uh, in Florence, uh, we, we can actually um, uh, show you this uh, little video where several years back, I'm, I'm still there in, in Florence and you will see um, a son of a very famous Russian great filmmaker, Andrei Tarkovsky. His son, Andrei, is a friend of the Academy and a friend of mine. And uh, he will um, be feature, he's featured in this little clip, uh, uh, and uh, definitely that tradition actually drew um, Andrei Tarkovsky to Florence. Uh, he spent some time in Florence. He shot one of his uh, very famous films, Nostalgia, that uh, also very much loved. That was all shot in Tuscany, uh, and Danina Guerrero. Gu Guerrero uh, who was his friend, uh, did a lot of uh, scouting for locations where they did shoot um, this movie. Um, I think it's very reflective also of this kind of cultural experience of the Russian man coming into, uh, yeah. into Italy, into the West. Uh, it's a very interesting and deep film. But there, there's that connection of Tarkovsky and his um, connection to Renaissance in general, to the aesthetic, because in his film, in his photography, in his composition, in his use of contrapasta and contrast, um, uh, use of the golden ratio and other things uh, that are present, uh, you know, in music of the period and in art of the period, and it transfers into his work. You hear Bach, uh, whom he uh, definitely uh, loved. And in fact, the church that I used to serve in when there was a me uh, memoriam to his father, he would come and his uh, wife, uh, the son, she is a violinist and she would play Chacona of Bach inside a uh, Russian Orthodox church built by Demidov, by the way, the same wow. family that sponsored the, uh, the last day of Pompeii. And I mean, Florence has become uh, a place of uh, pilgrimage for all the great Russian uh, culture uh, people, including uh, Dostoevsky. And not many people know that Dostoevsky finished his idiot uh, living uh, in an apartment overlooking Boboli Gardens of Palazzo Pitti. Wow. Or Tchaikovsky wrote his uh, Queen of Spades overlooking Florence from the villa on the, uh, on the San Miniato Hill. Wow. Um, well, one one thing too I wanted to add is that I think uh, if a lot of the people who watch this channel are big uh, fans of film, so they 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 would be very interested in Tarkovsky, the most famous Russian filmmaker, right? That his that lineage having that connection to the Academy. So, by the way, uh, we the only reason that we haven't done really in depth breakdowns of Tarkovsky films is that they're very difficult. <laughs> so. Like Stalker, for example, um, I've had to watch it twice. I've got about 10 pages of notes. It's an extremely dense, difficult film to decode. So it's just a matter of getting to it. And it's not something that we're trying to avoid. But I want to do it justice and see, I didn't even know that he includes, you know, golden ratio in, in his cinematography. So that's, so that's something I just learned. So I'm glad to know that before I actually went and did the deconstruction of the film. Well, I, I mean, when we say... Cinematog cinematography and r golden ratio, we have to be careful because it's not a static, um, it's not a static frame. So um, there is that movement, but there is the, the sense of harmony that is based on these classical proportions. And he alludes to it and he talks about it. And of course it involves the, uh, the cameraman that he works with on different films. And one of the uh, Berkman's cameraman was making most of his uh, films that were made um, uh, past uh, Andrei Rublev in, outside of Russia when he uh, defected from Russia. Um, uh, I would love to actually, maybe God willing, um, do something with you on Andrei Rublev because yeah, let's that's do that. one of yeah. my we'll do that down the road. favorite. Yeah. 
and may, maybe if you if you and now I'm being kind of inviting myself. No, I've I've that. done uh, long notes on on that film as well. So yeah, we can do that down the road for sure. Oh, that would be great. I'd be um, like, I feel like I've fulfilled something in my life on that level because that movie really deeply um, communicated to me the the whole sense of what it means to be orthodox and uh, and there is an interesting connection if you remember at the very end of the film where the italian uh, ambassadors come right that very final almost uh cathartic scene of the bell where the oh, yeah. the the whatever the party called it, the swinging of the of the bell um, we call it the tongue actually in russian the tongue of the bell whatever that is called in English, I don't know, but there is a conversation that takes place behind uh, be, uh, the, the horsemen, the two or three of the ambassadors, very important people, they come from Italy. And in some translated versions, you actually don't see what they're talking about because it's not dubbed. But they're having an Italian, in Italian, they're having a conversation just recently. And I've seen it before in some subtitle versions, but not in all. But recently, my friend who uh, speaks Italian perfectly, his name is Justin. He's uh, uh, lived in Italy for a while and lives here. And he, he watched the movie and he said, oh, it was really cool because I could understand what they were saying. And that conversation is a very, very important uh, quintessence of the relationship because they're going, that thing is not going to ring. Are you serious? Look right. at that. Look at what's got yeah. everything is dirty. Everything is falling apart. And then, you know, bomb and it, you know, the ringing. And uh, it, it's a very couple of words of the skepticism, you know, is that, you know, what can help? What, what good can come out of Nazareth, basically? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's a profound film. I don't I Hopefully it's not a spoiling of the film, but just to kind of, uh, give our viewers an, uh, an inspiration to watch it and maybe for us to do something together. To talk yeah, that's about. a great idea. Absolutely. Do you want me to finish up? On yeah, go ahead and, and uh, close okay. out there with the Academy and, uh, and what? Yes, and a geometric bit. Um, yeah, I'm just showing some of the, uh, like this stretching uh, drawing of, um, of the back of, um, they actually use the, in the Rapin Academy, they use some of the special forces guys who are out of work uh, to come in because their musculature is very refined in, in our gymnastic uh, exercise routines. They're important for artists. See, these academic drawings are not necessarily about, you know, being always finished works. They're studies. They're studies like scales that uh, play most important part for the artist. I recently watched a documentary about uh, Yasha Heifetz, who was one of the greatest violinists uh, mm -hmm. considered of the 20th century. Well, I was, it was interesting to find out that the main practice that he did, he played scales. I mean, he religiously, every morning, he played scales. Boring, boring, monotonous yeah, right. <laughs> stuff. But that's what makes... Uh, it's the it's the, it's the alphabet. It's what makes the words out, and then and it's the DNA of the music, basically. And the, we see these type of examples in academic work. Oftentimes, people think that, oh well, this will look like a finished painting, so uh, I want to look at you know. But academic work is is that is the scales, and uh, it's the studies that you will have to humble yourself to do if you want to look anything like what those masters look like in their final already established, you know, uh, work. All of it came from these types of drawings and studies that you see, the, the, the likes of which you see that I'm showing. Um, there's some portraits, some drawings. My, my very favorite, the drawings of what, the St. John, the old man with, with the scroll. Uh, again, drawing an old person is not a simple thing understanding anatomy and mm -hmm. then ability to portray the folds of the skin, the age, the, uh, the dripping, all of that, if you don't have the knowledge of anatomy, of which we do uh, have a very extensive course in anatomy, I'm currently working on translation of the mimic part of anatomy and all the entire anatomy course for the academy for our online program as a plug, I would say is still a, 
a very uh, most comprehensive, most detailed studies of the musculature, of the face, of the body, of the skull, of the jaw. Understanding of these things for an artist are absolutely uh, necessary. If you're trying to become a visual artist that wants to paint or draw life figures and really be able to communicate the age, the wisdom, the subtle emotions, all these things that are possible only in painting and drawing. And I will underline that, not in photograph, because painter has an incredible level of control and an ability to express themselves within the reality that they're portraying. And uh, that's another topic of conversation. But I will I will uh, be going through this real quick. There is a staged crucifix. It's purposefully shown as a stage. Um, his hand is tied to the plank, horizontal plank. Um, uh, this guy is a, is a wonderful uh, model. I know him personally. He, um, he was kind of like borderline homeless man, uh, kind of a kind of very, very sweet mm. guy we found and uh, hired him to do a lot of, he does a lot of, we, you'll see a lot of his uh, face and our students drawings, very nice man to draw as a model. Uh, there's a, a scene from the Bible, um, the New Testament, the healing of the blind, the large, it's a large painting done by one of our uh, four-year students. As a uh, at the end of the four-year course, you do a like in academic tradition, you're uh, to do a uh, monumental work that would be of uh, religious uh, subject matter. Or if you don't feel comfortable with mm -hmm. religious, you can do philosophical or social commentary work or whatever it is that you pick, but mm -hmm. we do still adhere to, again, decency and um, kind of a traditional value right. in our encouragement, our students to uh, to adhere to those things without repressing anyone or forcing them. But if you're if you're going for epitage of the postmodern spirit, uh, probably our academy is not for you. There's a million of them in the world, so we're not discriminating. You have uh, we are pretty much one of the only ones. Only ones, yeah. Yeah, if 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 not the only one. Now, and uh, right, and I'll put the link below if you're watching. And uh, you said that people should mention if they are interested, they should mention you, right? Uh, yeah, certainly. I work for the academy. I am also um, I'm a art history professor. I work on, and I'll get to this at the very end shortly to conclude. Mm -hmm. Um, I work on art history and the context of geometric uh, compositional analysis of works of the old masters. That's sort of my niche. Um, but I also work as a director of international relations, and I help to spread the word about this missionary work that we're doing, missionary in terms of culture, art, uh, and classical tradition. And um, uh, you, you, all you have to do is simply mention my name and you should get some perks uh, uh like free classes maybe evening classes uh we're also aiming at the online program due to covid uh situation as things hopefully will restabilize everybody has a chance to go uh and start studying online which i highly recommend honestly because there's a lot of catching up to do and in fact, when you come to Florence, if you are coming into, um, you know, studying classical art environment, it's better that you have some groundwork before it's like, you know, going to conservatory and you, you never held a musical, like you never played a violin. And you're like, you know, you, you want to start somewhere. And the unfortunate thing is, is that if you start wrongly, it's also bad. Then they have to reteach you how to, you know, hold it right. So there's a bad side to learning wrongly, and there uh, is an opportunity to start getting uh, in into into the stuff before you actually arrive in Florence, so you can uh, accelerate fast. Though uh, level of competitiveness as far as entry level, and I want to say a word about that because I think it's incredibly uh, fascinating. In Russia, 
during the Soviet period. And we wanted to mention that. Remember, Jay, we talked about this before, uh, how actually it's a remarkable phenomenon that classical art actually survived in Soviet Russia. Do you remember that part? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so uh, interestingly, um, after revolution, and also tragically, of course, they kind of uh, they kind of crushed down on everything modern and everything progressive and everything that then the Germans called the generate art, and then prosecuted all these uh, wonderful people and artists. Uh, there's this whole vendetta and uh, other issues, but in the Soviet Russia, it was also considered to be uh, non-productive and almost dangerous because of its freedom of sort of yeah. expression and right. thinking. They wanted to confirm everyone to uh, certain, uh, you know, uh, repressed way Is of this being. The Soviet but realism period. The Soviet realism became another name for classicism. Because they could call it classicism right. with all the bourgeois, you know, uh, monarchical associate, religious associations, of course. So, but the technique, the mechanism, the system of knowledge is just like Photoshop. Basically, they put it to use for Russian propaganda. However, um, it wasn't entirely, you know, not everybody who was a classical trained painter in Russia was working for propaganda. There was just no other way to go through this right. system. So a lot of gifted artists went into that system, worked for propaganda part-time and worked for the, the soul, so to speak, and yeah. part-time. And um, the main thing is, is that was continually state funded and it became uh, also continually uh, more and more competitive. So by the time some of our instructors, and by the way, our instructors in the Academy in Florence are all uh, graduates from Repin and Stiglitz and uh, major Russian uh, academies were going to school at the time when Soviet Union was still uh, intact. And this, listen to this. You know how many people it took per place to enter, say, Repin Academy, Royal Academy at the, at the time, uh, in the 90s, in 89, 500 people per, per place. Wow. That was a whole wide country competition. And huh. people that came in to enter that school already had to have ground-based knowledge right. in order to even compete for the place that out of you know 20,000 they had 200 places wow. so that was uh best of the best and um now it's not as um strict in russia as it yeah. was but still the competition is very high and um well it's uh it's a still slightly different philosophy of teaching it still carries over a lot of uh, uh, Soviet sort of like, it's very extreme. It's very, you know, uh, disciplined and strict. And not everybody from the Western mindset is ready for that type of transition, to be honest. That was one of the reasons why we created a little bit of a softer sort of uh, version of it that allows people who come, unfortunately come from a place where they were never criticized in their life. Mm -hmm. Anything they doodled on a piece of paper was always applauded and, you know, yeah. and posted on the board. And that is a good thing, except that when you don't ever hear anything constructive, it Can't becomes a problem too. So there's a fine golden middle line that we're trying to find. So just to calm everybody down who is now rushing to apply to Florence Russian <laughs> Florence Academy of Art, uh, and they're going, oh my God, do I have to compete? No, actually you don't. Because uh, our philosophy is that if we teach you properly, you will learn. And we have more than 10 years of progress to show that it works, even for people who are coming from ground zero. But uh, to enter the school, you just need to submit your work to show us where you are. But then we will teach you the same way the artists are taught in the academic tradition for the past 300 years, mm -hmm. except that some of you will begin at at the lower level, some of you may have some experience, 
and some may have to be retaught on some levels, which is also fine. We deal with all variables in all the personalities, and we definitely deal with people personally. So the sizes of our classrooms are limited. The instructors that don't speak English, most of them are Russian professors. Uh, we have a uh, translator walking with them. In fact, when I started helping the academy, I was one of their uh, on uh, call translators. I walked with the instructor and co continuously translated everything about what they're doing with each student. So I actually integrated most of the curriculum. And now I'm also translating most of the curriculum into English from uh, Russian lectures that you will see in our online program. Um, so with that said, um, I don't know if there are more academic questions. If you may have one to ask. No, I mean, me. if if we want to go ahead and close, um, is there anything else you wanted to say about um, geometry and geometric analysis, or do you want to save that for another talk? I would like to, if with your permission, just to give a little sort of a infomercial on what and by the way jay i want to thank you for allowing me to talk for so long sure. on this i can uh and i really do appreciate being able to share this um i also want to thank you for working with me on the geometric uh, process that i've been involved with. jay has been extremely instrumental and helpful in uh editing uh my book um well or my my work uh on this topic and him and uh his wife actually anastasia worked as editors for uh, the the book that is still not hasn't come out so i'm not actually selling it but i'll just show you the the cover of the this is several chapters that we did on geometry um and uh art and culture that has to do with geometric analysis of works and uh I mean, I, I can't show this in the video very well, but you can see some of the analysis here with, right. uh, with Leonardo's Les Sopper and the sacred geometry um, and geometric figures. And um, basically to summarize this work, um, I will quote John Kepler, who said, geometry is one and eternal shining in the mind of God that share in it accorded to humans is one of the reasons that humanity is the image of God. Those, of course, are words of Jonas Kepler, the physicist, astronomer, scientist, and certainly not uh, you know, a theological uh, dogma, but an idea that I find very uh, interesting and important and true. And uh, in conclusion, I can show a couple of examples of our lecture material uh, that we worked on with Jay um in few slides just to give you a preview of what maybe will come later if we continue to do these conversations or dialogues or uh, maybe i will simply have some lecture formats of this work that i'm doing yeah so that's great. yeah here is uh, just a few slides you can see portrait of luca pacioli attributed to Jacobo de barberi from the 1495 um, this one is a very blatant example of geometry. It's, it's completely uh, revealed. We see him holding a, a pointing, pointing stick at the geometric uh, image. Uh, I, I like this work also because the young man on the right or on the left, whichever you look from, uh, is a trip. They think it's uh, Albert Durer. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not confirmed, but I, I would like to think so because Albert Durer is sort of this uh, symbolic figure who came from one place, uh, Germany at the time, to Italy, mm -hmm. and actually dived into the whole Renaissance of the Italian Renaissance, not to diminish German Renaissance by all means. They were very advanced and incredibly evolved as artists already, but Italian Renaissance had some major influences on uh, Durer, and so I tend to believe that this might be him. Regardless, in this work, I'm just going to show you some fragments of the analysis of this work. The next shot is um, this is the enlarging of the geometric structure that is present in a book 
uh, by Euclid, you can probably see on the edge of the little board that mm -hmm. says Euclid's. Um, and that is going back to the classical antique tradition and study of geometry, study of uh, classical culture and science of the classical um, uh, tradition. Uh, the next shot, you can see um, now the transposition of the same exact geometric shape onto the composition. And um, I'm not going to get into it because I'm just showing you fragments to kind of hopefully intrigue you into knowing more about this and uh, going with us on this journey. But this just shows how interestingly these um, uh, things were thought and deeply, deeply programmed into artworks. And this is just one example. Uh, the next shot, you see a little further uh, geometric unfolds where you get two circles. One of inner circle is simply going through the edges, upper and lower edges of the of the paint, painting, of the field of the painting. And that inner circle, um, when we make a close up, then remarkably shows these uh, points of placement of different objects in the paint in the painting itself um and um it, it's uh, i'm marking these points to show that nothing is really accidental in this work I'm not saying that every artist has to do this but i'm just pointing out this science that they had cultivated very deeply with references by the way his hand is pointing on a place in the book of the elements of euclid that yep. everything is cross reference everything is uh, has an encoded meaning yes. and it's not necessarily hidden it uh, is done in order for you to go oh I didn't read Euclid's elements maybe I should so that I can understand it of course we don't have time to read the entire book but at least we can understand you know what this is coming from it's not just you know it all that classical didn't just happen because somebody came and you know took a brush and started going at it. Unfortunately, it's uh, not so simple. Here's another little gem of that work. The signature is placed on a little piece of paper that's folded. It's unfolded in the perfect um, proportion of two golden section rectangles. And even the corner of the paper, when you look at the close up that I just showed that inner circle, it actually it's actually cutting off that corner of the little signature paper right where the circle goes. So this, these, these, it's almost like he's the, the artist is talking and making uh, uh, interesting, interesting conversation with the with us. Uh, you know, if you notice, there's a a, a, a fly sitting on um, on the date, covering the last date of the date. Um, I don't know why, but that's just a wild thought. Mosca in Italian is a fly. <laughs> and they call Moscow, Mosca, the same name. And etymologically, they're actually saying uh, that mosquitoes and the Moscow have something in common that the place, some of the versions of the name of mm -hmm. Moscow is a place where there was a lot of mosquitoes. So they called it Mosca. And I don't know, maybe the artist went to Moscow when he finished this work. Who knows? That's just, you know, that's a, that's a pure speculation. I'm just uh, being, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, here you see the enlargement of that geometric shape. That's a glass shape that's hanging in the corner. It's a very specific geometric shape with a very long name that I will read out later. And the uh, surface uh, is filled with water. So there is this whole uh, mathematical reference to the value and the shape and uh, the amount of water. So they're getting into science. And if you look closer, you see reflections almost like little shots of photographs that you see inside that reflection, actually a building that was the palace of the Swartz family. So, I mean, there is an endless depth right. of nuances that I find extremely fascinating personally and um, willing and uh, excited to share with whoever wants to know. Um, and the next shot I'm showing the reference of size, that very shape, has exact same size as the circle um, that uh, this is, by the way, this is Luca Pacioli, uh, uh, forgot to mention the, 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 main, the main character. He is the person who wrote the, the, the Golden Proportion, the mm. book that 
became the you know the foundation of the right. Renaissance uh, sort of sacred geometry or mathematics. Okay. It was yeah. it was the book, and the illustration to that book were made by uh, no other than uh, Leonardo da Vinci. All of the illustrations, all the engravings right. in the book by Luca Pacioli are made by Leonardo. And um, anyway, so you see these uh, interesting findings and uh, the, one of the final findings that I wanna show is the linear perspective, uh, not to get too heady, but this is fascinating. This is, by the way, these are all primarily my own findings and discoveries. I'm not sure if other people have found the same things or not, yeah. but I have not found references to these findings. For instance, here you see a linear perspective analysis, the book, uh, that he's pointing to constructed in linear perspective of course everybody knows that all the lines in the proper linear perspective meet at the horizon line well all of the lines technically they do in this work and you can see the horizon line for uh, the board and for the book are in his forehead but the the other book takes us all the way to the left and what's remarkable is that all of those lines of construction for the linear perspective meet exactly at the crossing of the horizon line and the distance of the canvas moved over, exact distance. So right. even the point of convergence of the book is programmed into this image. So it's almost like a deep level programming of these harmonics of relationships, sizes, it's a, a very deep work. Nothing is accidental in this particular uh, approach. Nothing is just kind of thrown together, yeah. just throw a book, do it. I'm not saying it's wrong. I'm just saying it's, it's very interesting, the analytical aspects that go into this and the meanings and the almost scientific approach. And here is that uh, infamous shape that I wanted to, uh, I want to read it because I don't want to make a mistake. It's the Romba, cube octahedron it's a cube and octa means eight so it has eight sides in the cubical form and then it has these perfectly inserted triangles equatorial triangles uh, all of this uh, these geometry shapes exist in mathematical space-time continuum they are not something that people made they are something that people yeah. discovered right. within mathematical principles that don't I want to say govern reality, but are part of the structures of harmony yes. of life. It's a right. big mistake to think that they govern reality uh, from the at least orthodox Christian perspective, but they are part of the beauty and order of divine uh, creation that we uh, find in these levels and that these uh, our artistic traditions have tapped into in uh, very, very diligently explored and learn how to make poetry with these um, subjects and objects. Uh, right. The red uh, form, uh, the decahedron, um, is uh, on the right resting on top of the book in the actual uh, still right. life. And here, as a final shot, I made a, 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 a sort of a creative freedom here. Um, I made it almost like a matrix looking um, background of numbers. Well, that number that begins with 1618, that's the, uh, the, the continuation of that number is infinite. And that number is the uh, golden ratio in which this entire work is constructed and to which uh, Luca Pacioli dedicated, uh, well, his life. Um, I think it's very important to revive this knowledge, to keep it alive and uh, right. infuse it with a modern understanding. All right. So I think uh, we should probably close here, if that's okay with you. Is there anything, oh, anything else definitely. you want to leave us with? Uh, as I remind people that there's a link below, and remember to mention Father uh, Vladimir Kadenov if you are interested in uh, looking into the Florence Arts Academy. Absolutely. Anytime, feel free to reference to me, and uh, also I'm looking forward to more uh, fruitful discussions. I really enjoyed it, Jay. Thank you so much. God bless you and all the people who are watching us today and whenever they are watching me, the God and the peace of God and the knowledge of art and beauty uh, and the blessings of our Lord and Savior be with you always.
Awesome. Thank you very much, Father Vladimir. Appreciate it.